Assalamu alaikum. So thank you all for coming to today's event. Uh, my name is Osama, for those of you who don't uh, know me. Um, first of all, I would like to um, thank our sponsors uh, for helping us realize this uh, event. And uh, we're extremely proud to say that uh, our sponsors is pretty much the community who we strive to serve. So it's, it's you, and you who are watching us uh, online, because we are streaming this, uh, this event. So thank you so much. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Amel's Touch, uh, uh, an Algerian artist here in the UK who donated a number of artworks who are uh, on display at the end of the, at the back of the room. You can, uh, with a small donation, you can enter a raffle and maybe you'll win something to take home today. So, um, before we start celebrating Algerian science, before we start uh, celebrating the uh, winners of the Algerian Paper of the Year Award, I would just like to talk to you a little bit about annasab.org for those of you who are unfamiliar with it. <coughs> so, um, we're an independent initiative um, uh, which um, uh, we will launch in uh, 2011. And um, um, as the name says, the Algerian Network for Academics, Scientists, and Researchers. Uh, our aim is essentially to try to promote uh, scientific excellence, to promote science and knowledge in Algeria. That's the ultimate aim. I'm sure many of you share the same with us. Um, but um, we think a key, at least first step to doing this, is to build a community network, is to build a network of Algerian academic scientists and researchers um, to hopefully come together uh, strongly, independently, to uh, contribute towards building that um, uh, future, that scientific future, that um, um, prosperous future for Algeria. This is why, at the moment, we're focusing on building that network. So most of our activities is dedicated towards building a platform that supports interaction between um, um, the academic uh, community, the Algerian academic community, in Algeria and outside. Um, so in Algeria and outside is key, actually, because we believe that Algerians outside of Algeria, academics, researchers outside of Algeria, have a key role to play uh, in, in, in achieving that future. So being here in the UK, um, um, obviously we are quite keen on, on building those bridges between us here and our fellows um, in, in Algeria. The Algerian Paper of the Year Award is, is one of the explicit activities that we do which contributes towards building those bridges, hopefully. So our motto is to discover, share, and inspire Algerian intellect. So I'm just going to take you through, through a few things that we do to kind of try to implement this, this, uh, this uh, motto of ours. Uh, so we have a website, uh, uh, anasr.org, uh, as, as per our name. Uh, one of the major parts of, uh, of the website is the directory, an open directory of Algerian academics, researchers, and scientists. Anybody can join the network um, and um, uh, build a profile, and they will be automatically added to this directory. Okay, And then people can con connect with each other, contact each other, find out about each other, discover each other through this website. We'll build in a number of ex experimenting with a number of things on this website. One of the things we're doing is we have this community news and Q&A, some features, interactive features, uh, that um, hopefully contribute to increasing interaction between uh, academics and researchers. I invite you to uh, explore them and try them out and give us some feedback about what you think about it. The other thing we do is we have a, an online magazine, Inspire Magazine. Uh, the aim is to inspire uh, uh, the young generation by exposing them to the achievements of, uh, of Algerian academics and researchers around the world, including Algeria. So, very quickly about the, how this network works. What's the structure? Uh, at the moment, we have about 100. Well, we have 168 uh, member members, unless new ones have joined since this morning. Um, so these are everyone who just adds themselves to to the directory that we have. Um, when, whenever we have projects like the Algerian Paper of the, of the Year Award, we invite volunteers to come um, if they're interested to contribute uh, to come and join the team. So. Most of you who I recognize in this room have, for example, contributed to reviewing or shortlisting for uh, the Algerian Paper of the Year Award. Okay? 
which means that you committed to the to an nasr just for a short period of time, you know, contributing to a specific project, and that's absolutely fine. The more commitment or as much commitment as you want to give to the network, that works great for us. Um, and we have a core team. Uh, so these are the people who are, I guess, um, uh, committed <laughs> 24 uh, hours a day, seven days a week, uh, whatnot, to uh, to the um, to to the network. At the moment, there's five of us. But what's key is that there is a fluidity between these kind of um, kind of types of members, if you call them. Basically, what this means is that the more commitment you put in, the more active you are, the more you're automatically part of the core a core team. It's open uh, in this way. Okay. So if you're interested to be part of a NOS.org, to work with a NOS.org, all you have to do is just contact us and say, I'm interested to do this to help you with the website or to start a whole new initiative, and automatically you'll become part of the team. This is the team, <laughs> uh, um, if, if you don't know them. Uh, but they are here in the room if you want to speak with them uh, later on uh, to talk about stuff related to another. Um, I'll, I'll ask you to raise your hands, but uh, Abdul and Sofian are at the front, use for the back, and Omeitha at the back. Okay. OK, today is about the Algerian Paper of the Year Award. Okay, I haven't mentioned this as part of the um, since this is the key uh, of what we're here today. So Yusuf, in a minute, is going to take you through and describe to you what the award initiative is about. We're going to have the first session with a number of speakers. Um, uh, Dr. Abdelali Aguni is going to talk to us uh, about a, an exciting topic in biological sciences. Samir Dehani is going to do the same for physical sciences. And Yusuf will talk to us uh, about another exciting subject in chemical sciences. And when we do that, we'll then announce the winners of the Algerian Paper of the Year Award in these categories. We'll have a break, and then we'll do the same thing again for computer science of Abdul Jalil, uh, Nasa to talk to us uh, about uh, engineering stuff, and uh, Dr. Hanan Ali Boussita talk to us about medicine, pharmacy, and veterinary sciences. We'll announce the winners again in these categories, and then we'll have a closing. Okay? So, without further ado, I'll pass you on to uh, Yusuf, who's going to talk to you about why we are all here today. So uh, again, I would say what uh, uh, Usama just says, that thank you all again for coming, and the people who are online for watching, and most importantly, for actually the people who contributed to this. Because uh, this particular award would not really be a success, it would not even exist without the community, the Algerian community, actually doing the work. What we do as the core team, we actually facilitate stuff. We, we actually don't contribute our contribution is just managing the award. The shortlisting, the, the, the reviewing, the decision of who the winners are is actually by the community, what the community, which paper the community likes most. So I'll take you through a little bit about the awards. So the Algeria Paper of the Year Awards is actually um, an annual event, so we'll do it every year. And the aim is first to recognize and then to celebrate the achievements of Algerian scientists. And here we emphasize uh, recognize, celebrate, achievement, more importantly, of Algerian scientists, okay? Because we sometimes have interest from non-Algerians wanting to take part this for Algerian scientists who are uh, doing research either in Algeria or outside Algeria. The awards, they actually recognize uh, papers or research papers that are actually uh, published uh, in five research disciplines. We have biological sciences, we have chemical sciences, computer science and engineering, medicine, pharmacy, and veterinary sciences, as, and the last one is physical science and maths. And papers in every one of these disciplines, every year will choose a winning paper in, in any of these disciplines. So to be considered for the awards, the papers first, they have to be nominated. So we, we do not go and select papers. So for a paper to be considered for the award, either the, either the authors of the, award in the, of the papers or anyone else could actually nominate the papers. Following the nominations, the paper, then they go through a shortlisting step and then a reviewing step to determine the winning papers. Uh, the 2014 Paper of the Year Awards is actually our second edition. The first edition was last year, in 2013, and it attracted a lot of interest and it was uh, very successful. And uh, we are here today actually to recognize and celebrate the winning papers of the 2014 Algerian Paper of the Year Awards. Uh, before we do that, I'll give you some statistics about the papers we received this year. So before I do that, 
I will tell you about the team who's doing the work. So there is uh, myself on the top right there. We've got Asma Amrani from Algeria. She's the assistant professor at the, the University of Wuhan. We've got uh, Usama Matatla, and we've got Mohammed Bel Hussein, who's a PhD student in France in one of the French universities. And the four of us, as we said, as I said, we only facilitate the process. We don't nominate papers. We don't choose papers. We just receive them and send them to the right people actually to review them and shortlist them. Uh, so the process between 2000, uh, between the 15th of January to the 15th of February, uh, in one month, we open the call for nominations. And we receive, we wait for all the, all the nominations to be uh, nominated in five disciplines. Okay? And the criteria for us, very briefly, most of the work has to be carried out in Algeria. And number two, the paper has to be published in the year before. So in 2014, the award, the paper has to be published in 2013. And it has to be a research paper, so we don't accept reviews or book chapters, for example. And then after the nomination stage, which is for one month, then we'll have around 20 days for shortlisting. And in this case, we, we send the papers to people to look at them, and then shortlist, they choose the five papers per discipline. So people who are experts in physical sciences, for example, we send them the, phys send them the physical science paper. And they do the shortlisting, they choose the top five papers. And then the top five papers in every discipline, then we'll send them to an expert to actually look uh, very carefully at the papers and score them in five different criteria. And that will be, actually, you could find that online. But the awards, in essence, it starts by a nomination step and then shortlisting, then reviewing. And from the scores of the reviewing process, we actually decide what the winners are. Or the, the winners will be decided. We don't decide by the scores. We actually, we add them up, and the winner will be, will, will be decided. So today, on the 26th of April, we'll actually be announcing the winners for the 2014 edition. How did the nominations for this year look? So in biological sciences, we had 30 papers in biological sciences, 38 papers in chemical sciences, uh, 62 papers in computer science and engineering, medicine, pharmacy, and veterinary sciences, 34 papers, physical science and math, 75 papers. And we had 14 papers that did not meet the criteria, either because they were not published in 2013, or they were submitted after the deadline for nominations, or, for example, they were book chapters or reviews, so we don't accept them. So the total submissions was a very impressive 253, which we were very happy with. So looking at the papers that we've received, uh, so in here, what we looked at, we looked at the affiliations of the authors in those 253 papers. What the universities do they come from? University of Tlemcen, they had, for example, 26 papers. We have the usual suspects, the University of Tlemcen, Wahran, Stif, uh, Bab Zawar, Blida, Qasantina, they have the most contributions. We actually had some universities that only had one, one paper as a contribution. For example, we have Tiaret, Tbissa, Ndi, and Ghalizan, as well as the rest. So it's very nice to see the diversity or the number of universities that actually the paper is coming from. We have 32 different Algerian universities here sending nominating papers for the awards. So the aim next year, hopefully, to make it even more than 32, and hopefully the ones who submitted one, hopefully next year will submit more than one. So this is just a map to show you where the papers come from. The circles that you see represents where the universities, the universities from which the papers come from, and the size of the circle represents the number of publications. For example, we said Tlemcen and Wahran, they had, most of, they had a lot of publications, pretty much more than all the universities. But we also had in the center of uh, Algeria, we had uh, uh, Blida, Boumardes, and we had also uh, Bab Zawar, the contributions. Of Qasantina also have Biskra as well, they had, uh, they had a lot of publications. And we don't forget with Pasha as well, they had some, uh, some publications nominated for the 2014 Paper of the Year Awards. So how does this compare, as I said, the 2014 Paper of the Year Awards is the second edition. How does it compare to last year's? The numbers have increased, the number of papers nominated. In biological sciences, that wasn't the case. Pretty much last year we had 30, this year we had 30, exactly the same. Not the same papers, they were different papers. Uh, <laughs> chemical sciences, chemical science, we had an increase in 50% of the papers from last year. Uh, computer science and engineering went by 47%. Uh, the most impressive was medicine, pharmacy, and veterinary sciences increased by 53%. And the uh, physical science and maths went, to, uh, went up by 17%. The overall increase of nominations went from 160 last year to 253 this year. So around 34% increase. Uh, so now that's all from me about the awards. We'll pass you to... Uh
Okay. Okay, thank you everyone and for the ANSAF uh, organization for giving me this opportunity to address this uh, audience and also to address the community uh, via the internet to tell you a little bit about my uh, one of the aspects I'm interested in uh, with regards to my research at the University of Surrey and the broad idea of my research stream is basically to uh, uh, understand the new metabolic or the role that new metabolic and stress pathways play in uh, mediating cardiovascular complications associated with metabolic disorders, namely uh, obesity and type 2 diabetes. And uh, the focus today of this talk will be uh, uh, obesity and diabetes. As you can see here from this map, you can see the prevalence of diabetes in the world, and you can see clearly that apart from the traditional or the usual suspects, as uh, 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 you can see here, uh, America, Northern America, and Western Europe, the MENA region, which is uh, uh, the, the part where Algeria belongs, in North Africa and the Middle East, it has a very high uh, prevalence of uh, type 2 diabetes, with Algeria reaching 8.5%, for example, of uh, diabetics among the general uh, population. Uh, the F National Federation of Diabetics uh, consider that we have around 3 million diabetics in Algeria, and there are many more that are not yet diagnosed. Diabetes is not only a public health concern, but it's also an economic uh, uh, burden. And you can see here that uh, we have uh, 4.8 million people die every year of diabetes, with a staggering 471 billion US dollars are spent overall in the world to treat diabetes. The situation in Algeria is no different, with an annual cost of around half a billion US dollars are spent every year to treat and uh, prevent diabetes in Algeria, which you can compare to the figure of uh, 2.5 billion US dollars that has spent every year for uh, the healthcare uh, system in terms of importing drugs and uh, treatments. So diabetes is very closely associated with obesity and diet-induced obesity that is related to lifestyle, Western lifestyle and uh, dietary habits is uh, 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 very clear today. And you can see from this diagram that uh, uh, the, the risk of developing diabetes increases in a very uh, strong uh, positive relationship with the increasing of uh, abdominal uh, obesity, which is now recognized to be the key, uh, uh, the, the, key uh, the, the type of obesity that triggers most of the complications associated with uh, metabolic disorders. Similarly, this uh, increase in uh, abdominal obesity and the increased risk of uh, diabetes is also associated with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. We don't die because we have high levels of sugar in the blood, but we die because of the complications or cardiovascular complications associated with diabetes. And you can see here uh, the HOPE study shows uh, uh, the cardiovascular disease, the deaths from cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, and all cause of deaths together. And you can see that there is a linear relationship between uh, ob abdominal obesity and uh, increased numbers of deaths from cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, and death uh, uh, as a whole. So there is a close relationship between obesity, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and death. So it is very important to understand the molecular mechanisms or the cellular mechanisms that change within the body and that will lead to type 2 diabetes and ultimately to cardiovascular disease to try and find new preventive and therapeutic uh, 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 targets. So uh, when we talk about diabetes and metabolism uh, disorders in general, we have to talk about insulin, the general manager of the uh, glucose levels in the blood. And insulin will target basically every single cell in the body, but particularly some uh, tissues are uh, uh, specifically targeted by the hormone like the adipose tissue, the skeletal muscle, the liver, the brain, and of course, the pancreas. And 
how all this works together. So when we have a meal, the levels of uh, glucose will shoot up, and then the beta cells within the pancreas will produce insulin that then will interact with the specific receptor that you can find on any target cell, which, as I said, is virtually every single cell in the body, with, uh, uh, but specifically those that I just mentioned. When insulin interacts with the receptor, there is an event of phosphorylation, so there is inorganic phosphate groups that will be added to the uh, luminar side of the insulin receptor, and this will give basically the signal to the cell that we should activate or promote some uh, 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 signals that will ultimately lead to glucose uptake, increased glucose storage, that will reduce the levels of glucose in the blood. One of the mechanisms I'm interested in, in terms of research, is the role of phosphatases, which are a group of enzymes that basically, what they do, they just dephosphorylate these uh, uh, phosphates here, remove them, and therefore impair these signaling pathway. And the body will respond by producing further insulin, trying to compensate for the mechan for, for, for this impairment, and this is referred to insulin resistance, the pre-diabetic state, which will then lead to the death of these cells. They produce too much, they are under heavy demand continuously, so they will lead to their death and therefore to diabetes and finally to the complications or the cardiovascular complications. My research focuses on one specific enzyme called protein tyrosine phosphatase 1B. And we have uh, generated a specific mouse where we deleted this gene specifically in the liver, one of the major targets of the insulin within the body, and we subjected these animals to high fat diet. This is what really we do. We go to McDonald's, we eat, we watch TV, and we are very sedentary. So we put on weight, and you can see here that under high fat diet condition, these animals, compared to their wild type, which have the gene, become obese to the same extent when they eat fat. However, when you look at their capacity of clearing glucose, so, so when you ingest glucose, the insulin will try to reduce the level of glucose, and that's what we call clearance. So we inject glucose to these animals, and then we monitor over time how fast they will clear glucose from the body. And you can see Clearly here, in black dots here, you have the knockout that they clear a lot faster the uh, glucose from the blood compared to the wild types, which has been accompanied also with an improved capacity of these animals to eject blood in, uh, into, the, uh, into the, uh, the body, which is called the cardiac index. So you can see here, when they eat fat, the wild type animals, they have a lower cardiac index, a lower capacity to eject the blood into the body, and the knockouts are completely prevented, so they have the same uh, uh, capacity of ejection of blood into the system uh, as normal uh, animals. So, in conclusion, Pitti Pombi is today, or liver Pitti Pombi particularly, is today a very attractive therapeutic target, not only for diabetes, but also for cardiovascular complications associated with diabetes. But before I leave you, remember that there is no replacement for a good, healthy lifestyle, balancing food choices, low sugar products, and being active like Makhloufi. And thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bilal. Is there any questions? Yeah, one question. Just, uh, it's very interesting to point out the pre-diabetic syndrome, which is quite prevalent nowadays yep. due to the fat around the middle. So have you also looked into cortisol effects, stress hormone, which actually works as a transporter once uh, insulin resistant becomes significant? Is that something interesting? It, it, actually, no, 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 not cortisol. Because it, 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 but stress as a, a per se, yes. You know, oxidative stress, for example, rich, re, on the plasma reticulum stress uh, also. It, 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 the, this kind of stress, yes. And I think there is a, an, a, a quite genuine interlink between the uh, 
the stress and cortisol is a response basically to stress. Yeah, and and it causes glucose to, to, to go up. Yeah, but, well, no, uh, I, 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 we didn't really investigate cortisol at all, but uh, surely there is a link. Yeah. Well, thank you. One other question. Okay. Yes. I've heard from reading newspapers in Algeria that um, uh, diabetes amongst um, young children, uh, also incidences of, uh, of cancer have increased. Uh, do you have any more information about what's happening in Algeria to uh, to the population in general about the, the problem of Algeria is very difficult to have a, a very um, precise uh, surveys and and diagnosis. There's a problem of diagnosis in Algeria. It, it's very common that someone is diabetic, he's testing his blood sugar and he will test his neighbor or friend and then by coincidence he will find that also his friend uh, is also diabetic and if you compare the figures to uh, uh, in Algeria to our neighbors for example yes we can uh, uh, suspect that there is a problem of uh, diabetes type 2 diabetes I'm not talking about the type one which is genetic and only 10 percent of people can have it it is starting to, to kick off because of obesity in children for example in the UK we we'll start talking about one in ten children at reception are obese at reception, which means uh, three, four years old. So I don't think Algeria is uh, anything different because the figures in Algeria are even more important than in this country, for example, where we have uh, more uh, statistics available. Uh, uh, but definitely the problem is uh, uh, reaching even younger children. Uh, uh, Probably uh, uh, because of the change in lifestyle, uh, in physical inactivity, which is very, very high in Algeria. I think we are around 40% of inactive people in, uh, in Algeria, according to some uh, few available surveys. Yeah. One more question. Is there one back? And could that research actually lead to a new therapeutic agent that would Yes, actually there, there is some, um, here I mentioned uh, uh, liver pit pion B as a, a target, it's easier to produce, uh, I speak under the control of the Raji who is a chemist and probably other chemists, it's probably a little bit easier to produce a, 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 a chemical that can target an enzyme and will go uh, to the liver and produce the, uh, the effects, uh, 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 you know, quite uh, uh, immediately. Uh, uh, however, it's not very easy to produce uh, an inhibitor for a phosphatase because phosphatase is a very small family of uh, enzymes, and the uh, active pocket is quite similar between the uh, the two. For example, uh, SHP2, which is another phosphatase, shares 70 percent of homology sequence between uh, with PTPONB and therefore a specific ta selective target, uh, we don't talk about specific, selective target chemical can be very challenging to produce. Nevertheless, there are some available at the moment, but they are all at the preclinical level. Nothing is yet at the clinical phase, even one or two. Yeah. Well, let's thank uh, Dr. Agoni. Thank yeah. Thank you, everyone. And um, so I'd like to um, thank and Saar for um, inviting me to talk here uh, and also to address our audience um, online. Um, so what I will be talking to you today about is um, uh, on the subject of building a highly efficient solar cell uh, which is some of the work that um, I did at Sharp Laboratories of, of Europe uh, which is um, based in Oxford. Uh, so in terms of the content what I will be talking well, I'll, I'll talk about the Sun, uh, its properties, why are we interested in this huge uh, source of energy um, and then I'll talk about the photovoltaic process which is the process of converting photons into electricity um, then I'll discuss the ideal solar cell you know what what is an ideal solar cell how we would like to build uh, this solar cell I'll talk about the multi-junction approach and, and uh, at the end um, talk about recent developments right so in terms of the Sun uh, I just wanted to put some numbers here the Sun delivers approximately, this is a minimum figure, a thousand watt, one kilowatt per square meter. So wherever you are on Earth, approximately, 
um, then for every square meter there is a one kilowatt dropping of, of light energy uh, which is constantly irradiating this one square meter. Um, some of you may not really sort of understand this number quite well and relate it to your everyday life. So I'd like to ask the audience now to see how, per day what's what do you think your energy consumption per day for an average house? How much do you consume per day of energy? Has anyone looked at their bill and did some calculations? <laughs> anyone? You can tell me how much it costs. Well, how much? It, right. So how much do you pay roughly a month? Sorry? 2,000 a day. Okay, that's, that's, you, are, you, are, you are very good. You are on the low level. <laughs> so roughly, so, you know, so I think you can just guess. I mean, if you say I'm paying around 100 pounds a day, uh, a month, for example. Sorry, a day, that would be too much. 100 pounds a month for your electricity. Uh, roughly, the energy per kilowatt is around 10p or something. Then it's kind of 10 kilowatt uh, hour per, per day. This is how much you, you consume. This is on average. This is quite you know decent amount of energy that you consume per day. Between five and ten, I'd say, is the average household. Um, so if you think about it, then say for example, let's take ten kilowatt hour per day. So what this what this says is that for every square meter there is one kilowatt hour. So if if you leave this running for five hours, you have five kilowatt hour. So on an average day there is five hours of sunshine. Then you have five. So 50% of your energy can be actually supplied by only a square meter uh, of a, of a, of a, of a of, um, say if it's 100% efficient solar panel. So if you have two square meters, then that's it. You, your energy is totally delivered from the sun. So this is really the potential that we are talking about. This is why there is a big interest in actually in, in trying to push for these solar cells to uh, to be used widely. Um, because if you can really, uh, you know, harness this energy source, then we can potentially become zero carbon um, efficient. But the problem is um, that this large um, amount of energy is actually delivered over a wide range of spectrum or, or wavelengths or photons. There are photons of different energy or different wavelengths. So you don't come on, um, you know, the light. There is red light, UV. There is visible that we can see. There is infrared, and roughly the spectrum on Earth looks like what the uh, the bottom figure uh, there. Um, you know, so it's not just a simple um, sort of um, uh, spectrum. It's quite complicated. Uh, you know, there are different wavelengths for those who don't know um, that the electromagnetic spectrum is composed of, uh, you know, different wavelengths. The ones we see are between 500 and 700 nanometers. Um, the UV is around 200 nanometers, and then the infrared is uh, above uh, 1,000 nanometers. Um, so for a solar cell, what we are trying to do is actually capture this light and turn it into, into electricity. And what we use to do that is, uh, are called, is a, a special type of materials called semiconductors. And uh, what happens is when a photon of specific energy falls onto a semiconductor, it creates electrons inside this semiconductor. And if you design properly a solar cell, what happens with these electrons is that they move around until they reach a contact and then they, uh, they are delivered into uh, an external load, which can be your um, sort of machine or whatever you can put in there. So they are delivered in the circuit and you have electricity running outside the circuit. But the key thing here is uh, is the semiconductor or the solar cell. The, the way it works here is, is quite um, important to understand. Uh, so as I said, the main th material we use is, are called semiconductor materials. For those who don't, who don't know semiconductors, they are different uh, than conductors. Conductors conduct electricity. But semiconductors have a, a property called the energy gap. Um, so what the energy gap is, is a gap between what we call a valence band, which is where all your electrons actually sit inside the material. Um, so all my electrons are here. Then there is a gap. There is nothing there. Electrons can't exist in this gap at all. And suddenly there is a conduction band where electrons can exist there and can flow, most importantly. Here they can't flow because everything is full. Electrons can't find an empty space to move around. Uh, but once they are here, they can move around. 
And if they can move around, we can extract them. They can go into, um, they can produce electricity. Oh. Right. Um, so when a photon comes, this is what happens with a semiconductor. When a photon comes, it generates, it moves this electron, which is in valence band, into the conduction band, and therefore conducts electricity. Now you can straight away see that this photon energy has to be quite specific with the semiconductor. So if it's low, lower than the band gap, then it just goes through. And we call the semiconductor to be transparent. It doesn't absorb light. If it is right at the band gap, it will absorb light. If it is above, it will also absorb light. But it will absorb it somewhere there, and then the electrons will cascade down and then uh, lose some of that energy and then uh, still be converted to electricity. Now, the ideal solar cell that we're looking for is a solar cell that absorbs all the light. We want all the light to be absorbed so that we have the maximum number of electrons generated. We want there to be minimum losses. We don't want to generate electrons high above the conduction band and then lose energy as heat. We want it to be, as, you know, we want the right band gap so that we can absorb efficiently uh, the light. And we all obviously want the effic an efficient extraction of electrons uh, and holes, uh, you know, a good contacts uh, and stuff, minimum resistance. So when you think about all these uh, properties, you think, okay, which semiconductor I'm going to use, which band gap I'm going to use. Well, obviously, people have done lots of theoretical work, and this line here describes, look, which is based on the spectrum that we receive on Earth. So if we choose a semiconductor with, say, um, a band gap of one electron volt, then probably we will achieve an efficiency of 23%. So this is the efficiency that we would achieve. Um, and you can see there is a, a, a maximum there around probably 1.4 electron volts, where we actually reach a maximum in terms of the efficiency we can do, we can we can achieve here. In real life, obviously, we don't we can't sort of just pick a, a band gap and, and find the material. Obviously, there are existing materials with specific band gaps. And you can see here that this is germanium, for example. This is silicon. This is gallium arsenide. Um, and you can see why people have chosen silicon. Well, it's not as good as gallium arsenide, but it's cheap. You can, you know, people can actually, you know, if you think, oh, why don't we use this because it can achieve much higher efficiency? Well, it's because it's very expensive. And um, it's actually probably, you know, almost 100 times more expensive than silicon. Silicon is just um, available everywhere. It's just sand. Um, so this is why everyone is going for silicon. But even then, as you can see, you know, we are at the, around 23%. We can't, we can't do more. And the reason we can't do more is because of this. Silicon is a single sort of semiconductor. It has a band gap. So light which is below its band gap, it will pass through without being absorbed. Light which is of the order of its band gap, it will be absorbed efficiently. We get electrons out. But light which is higher than the band gap of, of, uh, of silicon, it will still be absorbed. But all that energy is wasted. So it will be absorbed there, and it will just waste it as heat, and then come, 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 come again. So we are wasting quite a lot um, of, 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 of energy. And this is why single junction solar cells can't achieve beyond, say, 25% efficiency. That's if it's a very good solar cell. Right. One minute. Can I have some more? Um, so the multi-junction approach here, which I think most of you will start to understand why we wanted to do this, we will, what the multi-junction approach is about is about splitting this energy spectrum into small chunks and building a solar cell out of these different um, semiconductor junctions. So for example, the high energy photons will be absorbed at the top, and then lower energy photons will you know, travel down and then be absorbed in the middle, and then very low energy photons will, absorb, will, be, will be traveling all the way through and will be absorbed by the bottom junction. So this way, we ensure that every portion of the electromagnetic spectrum is absorbed by the right semiconductor so that we don't waste energy. So everyone will be like the green one here. It's absorbed, and then straight away, it, it's, the electrons get conducted outside without having to um, you know, lose their energy and then be conducted again. So this is a map of the energy efficiencies and how, how this approach has actually you know, driven the efficiency of solar cells. All these lines here are for single junction solar cells. For example, silicon, as you can see here, there are different types. One single crystal, which is really high quality silicon. This is multi crystal line, which is slightly lower quality. It's cheaper, for example, when you buy panels. If you find them cheaper, know that it's probably multi crystal line. But that affects their efficiency. So you can see they are of the order of 24, 25. So, and we are reaching the theoretical limit. Whereas the multi junction approach, 
you know, we are getting all the way closer and closer to 50%. We are around 44 now. This is quite an old result. So Sharp hold, held the um, the record at around 44.3%. Just one, one extra minute. Uh, but it was broken by another German company. Now they 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 achieved 44.7% efficiency. Um, so you can see how what well, everyone is trying to push towards 50% because it will be big. A uh, big thing to achieve 50% to say we converted 50% of the sunlight into electricity into useful energy, and this is you know the figure that everyone is is, is going forward. Uh, so finally, thanks very much for for your attention, and if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, again, I trust related to Algeria because I think it's very opportune. Um, where are we in Algeria in terms of developing a not an energy policy, but um, something specific, a solar energy policy? And what about the the uh, famous or infamous now desert tech project? And what's Algeria's uh, yeah. take on it? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to be honest. I'm not an expert in what happening, what's happening in Algeria because for one reason, there is, it, you know, it's very difficult to get information there from there. This is my personal experience. But we do have an energy policy. There is uh, a center for the development of renewable energy, which is established a long time ago, and they are doing quite good work in terms of uh, trying to implement this energy policy. Um, and yes, they are working hard in terms of trying to, um, you know, create applications. I'd say uh, using solar solar um, power. So, for example, I heard there are there are projects there which. Uh, where they use the solar panels to pump water from um, wells so that they can use them in agriculture in remote areas where electricity can't get into there. So this is a very, very a nice application. Um, so yes, there are projects, there are factories which are planned to be uh, built to try and uh, make these solar panels. Uh, but in terms of my own sort of uh, personal opinion, I think it will be hard to kind of compete in terms of producing solar panels because there, you know, there is a fierce battle between different companies including Sharp and, and, and other players, very strong players in the world, uh, you know, producing large volume solar panels and driving prices down. So it will be really hard to actually compete uh, with those. So it will, it's better just buy the solar panels from somewhere else. Uh, what we can do is actually create systems and it's at a system level that we can innovate. For example, Combining a solar panel with a pump to, you know, um, sort of to pump water from deep wells. That's an interesting system that you can, you can, it can be built, and it, there is lots of things that we can optimize in this system, uh, and we can build an industry around it. For example, this is one one application. For example, um, but I'm of the opinion of, you know, moving away from the core stuff like what I've been talking here because it requires a lot of investment. There is fierce competition. And um, and move towards the system level where you can use you know the technology and do clever things with it. Okay. Thanks very much. Our next speaker is going to be uh, So. I'm going to tell you about uh, how to sneak synthetic molecules into cells, okay? And it's a big challenge, all right? And people in, in science, the biologists look at it a different way, the chemists look at it a different way, the delivery guys would look at it a different way. I'm coming from a chemistry background, therefore I'm going to give you the chemistry um, perspective of how to sneak a synthetic molecule into cell, okay? And it's very important. So uh, when you have a cell here in the middle, obviously the, the size here is not representative, okay? So a small molecule is really small, the cell is really big. But if you have a cell in the middle, there's a lot of interest of how to get a small molecule, something that we synthesize in the lab, or as actually uh, extracted from natural resources, or how you get an RNA or DNA into the cell, how you get a protein into the cell, or even smaller than a protein, how do you get a peptide inside the cell, okay? And this is very interesting because all of these, you try to use them to manipulate the signal inside the cell. Maybe, or most commonly used for therapeutics, okay? So people, like the medicines that you take, there's more molecules and they get inside the cell. Uh, now it's becoming a big challenge because there's a lot of interest in RNA therapeutics, 
in proteins as, 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 as drug molecules and in peptide therapeutics. But the challenge is if how to get these inside the cell because the cell is very selective. It doesn't let anything to go in. So in conclusion, in terms of when you're looking at what gets inside the cell, you need to consider the size, you need to consider the charge, the charge nature of the molecules, you can consider the 3D shape, that's quite important. And there is uh, a property of the molecules that we call lipophilicity, is how lipid-like it is, okay? Because the membrane is lipid, if it is lipid, it's more likely it goes, comes across it. So, this is the general concept. What my interest is, in a class of molecules, they call nucleosides or nucleotides. Nucleosides and nucleotides, they're actually the building blocks of DNA or RNA. Any DNA or RNA is either made of what we call dioxynucleosides, this, these ones, or ribonucleosides, these ones in the bottom. The main difference between these two is this OH that you could see here. It makes a huge difference, okay? It's a simple change, but it makes a huge difference. So my interest is in these kind of molecules. Why I'm interested in these? Because if you take a natural nucleoside and make a small modification to the structure, you get a drug molecule, okay? If you take this dioxycytidine, it's in the DNA of every living organism, if you get rid of this OH, you get rid of it there, that gives you an anti-HIV compound. That's used for the treatment for HIV. If you take uh, dioxyguanosine, you delete, you take scissors, and you cut the bottom half of it, it gives you a cyclovir. If you cross the road to Sainsbury's, you will see them selling a cyclovir for cortisol. Okay? And if you take, for example, dioxythymidine, which is in DNA, and again, you replace this OH with an N3 and azide group, it gives you zovidin, okay? which is used for treatment for HIV. So they, this is my interest. They're very nice molecules. They're from nature. But if you modify them slightly, they give you a drug molecule. Okay? And the modification is not necessarily they take place in the bottom part, which is the sugar, this part, or the nucleobase. You might have the modifications in both. And all, very often, they give you very good drug molecules. They, they have one big problem. When you take a natural nucleoside or natural, natural molecule and you modify it, it actually inside the cell, it doesn't become as good as the natural one. Because if you take the unnatural one and put it inside the cell, it needs to be activated inside the cell. So we call it transformation. So the first transformation, second, and third transformation. It is after transformation to the third one, what we call the triphosphate, when it becomes active. So by itself, when you make it in the lab, it's not really active. When you put it inside the cell, it gets converted all the way over there. So the nucleoside analog therapeutics that are on the market they are not very, uh, very well phosphorylated to go from the first stage to the second stage. In fact, out of all the steps, the first step is the most difficult. And it makes common sense because the enzyme is used for the natural substrate. And suddenly you give it something that's unnatural, it might phosphorylate it, but the efficiency would be low. So you say then, why don't we leave this and we try to put on the cell this, this, and this. These are not very good drug molecules, okay? They are unstable, they get cleaved, to go back to the original one, to the main one, okay? And they have issues because of the charge they actually get, they, the cellular uptake is quite poor. So what can we do? If we have something in the lab or in cells, we know it's actually quite good, how can we make it into a drug molecule, something that the patient could benefit from? So here come the concept. So if you take the nucleoside and the first step to attach this, the phosphate, you know it's the most difficult, if you put this on the cell, it doesn't get inside the cell because of the negative charges. So the most obvious thing is what you do, you block those negative charges with whatever. But these groups that use them to block it, when they get, once they get inside the cell, what needs to happen to them, they need to come off to deliver to you what you failed to deliver from the first step. Okay? So you have something that blocks the charges, gets inside the cell, whatever blocks the charges comes off, and then once you deliver, the monophosphate, then it gets activated inside the cell to give you the therapeutic effect at the end, okay? And uh, someone I worked for before, he developed what we call, what is known now as the phosphoramidate, okay? So this red and this green, he worked for around 20 years to develop this red and this green. The red one should be this part, the green one should be that part, okay? 20 years, very smart guy. Here he is, at Cardiff University. So basically is an aromatic ring, and here you've got an amino acid and an ester, okay? 20 years to optimize it to where it is now. The question is, does it work? The question is before that, does it actually inside the cell, when it gets inside the cell, would it actually give you this inside the cell? And we've shown it for, uh, in a number of ways, that it's actually yes. If you take 
what we call the phosphoramidase, the blocked with the charges. It will actually give you what you want at the end, the monophosphate, using enzymes to cleave it. The concept is there. It's very, it's very, very, it's, it's shown. But the problem is, does it mean if you take something and block it in this way, and it gets inside the cell, it will give you the therapeutic effect that you could see? Will it make it better? Would this make it better than the nucleoside without the blocking? Okay? And the data are supportive of that. If you take this, this, for example, an anti-cancer compound called gemcitabine. If you take gemcitabine against prostate cancer or colon cancer, if you take the gemcitabine by itself, you will see a better improvement of 106-fold, for example, in uh, colon cancer, 14-fold in the prostate cancer. I will pass through this quickly. This is the most impressive. This is an HRV compound, OK? There is a back of it, for example, if you take the nucleoside itself, and then you make the phosphate and block it, there is an improvement of 9,000 times the potency. Okay? So you take something that is very poor to turn it into something that's really good. And we've shown it for uh, cancer, for HIV, HIV again, that's another HIV compound, that's the most impressive. And the big story came from hepatitis C. Okay? Hepatitis C, for example, if you take this one, is completely inactive. The activity here is 1.3, yeah? AZC, AZU, sorry. Is it overhead micromolar? It has no effect whatsoever. If you put this motif to it, it allows it to get inside the cell, it allows it to be active inside the cell. You get it from something that's completely inactive into something that has 3.1 uh, micromolar activity. So what are we now? Have this kind of motifs actually delivered dog molecules? All of this is just in the lab. The answer is yes. So this compound here uh, was made at Cardiff University 2008. Was, uh, was very active against HIV. There was a small company called Pharma that took it, and then Inhibitex, then Bristol Myers Squibb. For one compound made in the lab, I was there when the compound was made. This was sold for $2.65 billion, just the simple compound that you could see. A competitor who's using the same technology, as you could see, we, we said aromatic amino acid ester. That's aromatic amino acid ester on their different compound. Okay? They took it against for hepatitis C, very active. They were probably, they have uh, probably uh, better negotiators in the deal than what Cardiff had because they sold this for 11 billion pounds. Okay? And it became the first nucleoside analog phosphoramidate that is, included, that is actually approved. So now patients could use that particular compound for treatment. And it's actually, uh, the forecast for it is going to be the most, the biggest selling drug on the market over the next few years because there's a big need for it. But the technology is there. This is what we call developing platform technology that you could apply to different things. So the technology could apply to hepatitis C, HIV. In this case, for example, the same technology is being applied, for example, to anti-cancer, this compound, okay, with a company called the New Kana Biomed. So the technology is there. The question is, what else could we do with it? We know we could take small molecules, get them inside the cell. Very nice, very nice drug molecules. So now the question, the, the answer is what I'm going to tell you is that I'm working on trying to apply that technology to RNA, proteins, and peptides. And we go and acquire, we, we actually got some uh, very interesting data that we could actually apply it into all of those class of molecules. I'm going to finish here because otherwise Osama will just tell me off. So I am done. <laughs> Any questions, I'm free to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohamed. Any questions for you? Yes. Thank you very much. Very insightful and, Thank you. and very nice talk. Actually, it, 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 the question that I wanted to ask is how about RNA? Because we know that uh, you know it's a big, big uh, buzz today to uh, gene therapy. It doesn't work. We know it doesn't work perfectly yet. So this can be an alternative actually to uh, gene therapy, introducing, for example, interfering RNA, dsRNA, and knockdown cells in vivo. Let me tell you, most of the work, all the work that's been done so far, delivering phosphates has focused in small molecules. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I came from the lab and it came out, and that's what I'm doing right now on RNA. But I cannot tell you anymore, okay? Uh -huh. But the technology could be applied to any phosphorylated molecule that you want to get inside the cell. But there is very interesting data about RNA with this technology. Yeah, because you so, can make uh, it more stable for sure. and for sure. uh, with a longer life if it is... Uh, yeah, I'm not going to say that. Two more questions. One at the back and then one at the back. Uh, what's the safety profile of this new technology? 
So that was a very good question. A few years ago, people were saying when, when this gets inside the cell and the aromatic region comes off, it's quite very toxic. Because if you take phenol by itself, put in the cell, is toxic. Okay? But it turns out from the data in animals and even in humans, now it's approved. Yeah? It's quite safe. They're quite safe, uh, safe molecules. Yeah? In fact, uh, down the road from here in Hammersmith, they actually tried in the hospital the last compound that I showed you in the last slide. Sorry, Osama. This one, okay? And the safety profiles are fantastic. They're really good, actually, as well as the activity. So both, they are very good. Yeah. This might be quite a stupid question. I'm not a biochemist, but having learned a little bit about diabetes, what I believe was talking yes. about, can we use the same concept to try and um, make a glucose go inside the cell and therefore prevent, by, you know, the buildup of glucose in the blood and reduce diabetes, solve this problem? Is that? Can we use this kind of this technology? Kind of no, so diabetes is that the cells can't accept glucose and therefore. No, this kind of technology is a drug delivery technology. So if you it's if you delivery. so no no if you say to me something I have something that has a phosphate group negative charge it doesn't get inside the cell I will say to you this is what I prescribe for you. Okay? If you say to me we have a phosphatase we want to inhibit the phosphatase I will say to you no you, this technology is not for you you need to go and discover something else. Well, it, 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 well it, it, glucose is basically a natural molecule and it gets into the cell through a receptor. It, it's not a passive, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, transport, uh, transport. It needs receptor. So what uh, Yusuf is trying to do is talking about the passive introduction of yeah. an exogenous molecule into the cell. And that's in, in itself challenging yeah. for any drug. Yeah. They make it easier to obey. Okay, yeah. let's ask one more question. Yes. Um, do these molecules have potentially uh, indications for multiple sort of viral conditions? Like, you'd be targeting Hep C and HIV and you know, herpes simplex. By the same molecule? Or there would be a... No, you, you can't do that by the same molecule because before you apply the technology, you need to actually profile your molecule. So if you say to me, I have, uh, I have this compound, it's very good against HIV, then you apply, but it doesn't get inside the cell, you, up, you use this to get inside the cell. The good thing about this, it seems, when you apply the technology, it actually alters the profile. So we've actually taken some compounds that are known against, known to be active against viruses, yeah? And when you put them, apply the technology, and put inside the cell, it becomes an anti-cancer compound, okay? And it seems to, the technology is actually overcoming some resistance mechanism that you could see it in other cell lines. So it, it might change the application of some drug molecules, yeah? One more question. I have a stupid question. When you look at the chemical formula for your molecule, yeah. can you guess what is going to be good at? Or is it only after trial and error that you know what is good for and it's not good for? Okay. Yeah, if, I ha if I was very confident, I would say yes. But I'm not going to say yes. But we could tell you, if you see a molecule like this, you will know it has something to do with DNA or RNA. Because the origin of these kind of molecules, the, na the natural analogs, they're from DNA and RNA. So actually naturally existing in the cell. And we modify them a little bit. So if, as soon as they see, forget the part that we added to it, if you take the red part, I would say to you, this has to, to do something to DNA synthesis or, or RNA synthesis, okay? Either for the HIV, for example, they, they, they don't have this awake. Therefore, when they come inside the, the DNA, they stop the elongation of the DNA. It will stop and the cells will die, okay? For antiviral, they work by different mechanisms, okay? So in here, they will be inhibiting some enzymes that are actually important for the viral replications. For example, for viruses, yeah. Well, well, yes, please. <laughs> um, you've mentioned. Could you speak up just? A bit? Yeah, um, you've mentioned the application of cancer treatment, and you've given an example of gemcitabine, and that takes me back to my first question about the safety profile. Yeah. And um, you quite rightly mentioned that this is a passive uptake in sure. cells. Sure. Yeah. Um, which I mean, you use it in cancer, it means it's many different cells are going to take the drug, so you're going to be targeting inevitably yeah. some other drug yeah, cancer yeah, yeah. side effects. So yeah, yeah. Cancer at the moment seems to be going towards more targeted therapies. Yeah. Is there a new scope for that technology being used in that way? Of course, because if you look, if you look, the problem, the, the thing is, you could change what the blue is and what the pink is and what the red is Basically, you tune it. You do fine tuning of the molecules, and you could get them selective against one cancer cell line more than healthy cell or cancer cells. 
this the same compound is more selective, for example, against uh, you say prostate than for colon cancer. Okay, and you will do the same. So you you do you do not go and take this and, and stick it to anywhere. You actually need to play with this and this modify them. And the way you modify it, you actually could tune it towards a particular cancer that you want. Gemcitab been the last one I, I showed you here. It's very exciting. So this particular compound, one of the anti-clinical trials, they had in mind a certain type of cancer. But then they found that it's more active against another type of cancer. So they switched the whole clinical trials towards what they're doing now. So you could actually play with it to tune it against selectivity towards the specificity towards certain types of cancers than others. I think we'll uh, stop here. Thank you very much. Okay, so, uh, Thank you very much to our speakers. Now we get to the exciting, uh, the more exciting bit, I suppose, let's call it that, uh, where we announce the uh, winners of the 2014 Algerian Paper of the Year Awards in the uh, three categories that we just uh, heard our speakers um, uh, talk about. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to try to establish contact with our winners on the side of the room, but meanwhile, I'm going to... Um, what am I doing? I'm going to um, um, go to biological sciences, and before we announce the winners, we're going to see the runner-ups. So these are the uh, papers which have been uh, shortlisted in the first uh, first stage of the um, uh, uh, of the process of the selection process. They have been reviewed, uh, and um, um, uh, our winners is basically picked up from one of those. So the first one is, uh, um, I'm going to read the title, I'm going to try, this is Biological Sciences, I'm a computer scientist, so please excuse any uh, 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 mispronouncements. So the first uh, paper, actually this is, these are not in order, all of these are, have been shortlisted, um, um, uh, and they all have honorable mentions. Um, a paper from uh, uh, Wahran uh, called First Molecular Analysis FH Gene in Algeria, Identification of novel mutation. So well done to them for uh, uh, this honorable mention. <laughs> Second paper is the ended identification of four common athalassemia gene deletion among a group of hemoglobinopathies in STAFE population Algeria. This is from STAFE. Well done to them for the honorable mention. Uh, a paper from a collaboration between uh, uh, two cities, Khanshla and, and Xantina, uh, gel-free proto proteomics reveal potential biomarkers of printing, of priming, rather, induced salt toler tolerance in uh, durum wheat. Well done to them for the honorable mention. And uh, the final uh, shortlisted paper, the final honorable mention from Algiers, uh, if anybody wants to help me pronounce this stuff, feel free to uh, to jump in. Immunolocalization of uh, estrogen and uh, androgen receptors in the CAP2. These are really long titles. CAP2. Go for it. <laughs> CAP2 epididymidis of the fat and on the, of the fat sand rat. Well done to them for the honorable mention. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But now we get to the uh, uh, exciting bit. Who's the winner for the 2014 um, uh, Algerian Paper of the Year Award in Biological Sciences? Um, and this is going to be a paper from uh, the University of Annaba and Ataraf entitled. Quercet. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Quercetine alleviates predator stress-induced anxiety-like and brain oxidative signs in pregnant rats and immune count disturbance in their offsprings. Very well done to this paper for winning the award in biological sciences. I believe we have the winner online. Salam alaikum.
يا الو الو السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام ورحمه الله Uh, معك أسامة من لندن from the Algerian Paper of the Year Awards. أهلا بك شكون معايا؟ محمد لامين تومي محمد, محمد لامين تومي the first author مبروك عليك جائزة أحسن منشورة علمية جزائرية في العلوم البيولوجية uh, uh, عمل ممتاز جدا according to the reviewers so congratulations for this one, uh, win we're going to give you another round of applause because you're live with us Uh, would you like to say anything? Mohamed Lamin? Kamaya? I think it's a good thing to say that I'm going 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 For uh, this uh, opportunity you gave me, uh, this is a very interesting initiative uh, from you, and uh, I'm uh, very, very happy for it. Well, co-author stack. Obviously, this is a deserved win, according to the to the reviewers. Abqa uh, ma'ana, Dr. Abdul Ali Agouni is going to comment on your on your paper. Mabrok alik one more time. I have few slides. So, Mohamed Lamin, if you are with us again, I join my voice to uh, uh, Usama to congratulate you for this big work and for the achievement and for the prize, which is well deserved. So, I will just uh, probably mention a few things about the research that has been uh, conducted in uh, Algeria, in Annaba and the Taraf, and starting with the aims of your research, which uh, aimed basically to investigate the effect of psychogenic stress during late gestation on the immediate behavior and oxidative stress in the brain of moms or uh, uh, pregnant rats and on the count of immune cells in their offspring up to weaning. Also, you have investigated the preventive potential of a natural polyphenolic compound called quercetin on these effects. And the key findings that have been reported in this research were that quercetin supplementation in late pregnancy significantly reduced production of stress mediators and oxidative stress in the brain of pregnant moms. And quercetin also tended to attenuate uh, 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 maternal anxiety. Now, the most important bit of this research is probably its potential impacts both uh, mid-term and long-term uh, impacts. The first one, to my opinion, is uh, to increase uh, public awareness about the importance of nutrition, particularly during pregnancy. Secondly, is to encourage dietary manipulations to increase the supply in those polyphenolic compounds, not exclusively to uh, quercetin, but in polyphenolic compounds and flavonoids to which uh, 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 belong quercetin. And also to influence public health policy uh, to, with regards to recommendations for polyphenol enriched supplements intake during pregnancy, particularly in the late or the last trimester of pregnancy. And finally, there is an economic impact, a potential economic impact of this research where we can commercialize a new uh, uh, pregnancy supplements where we can add these uh, polyphenols to the traditional cocktail of uh, oligo elements, omegas, and uh, vitamins that are routinely prescribed to pregnant women, at least in uh, 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 routinely in Europe. Okay. Again, uh, just to finish. Again, uh, big congratulations and big well done for this uh, nice job. So we move on to uh, chemical sciences. Um, must have given it away a little bit with that uh, pre-presentation slide. But uh, while we try to establish contact with the uh, winners, the chemical sciences, we're going to go through the honorable mentions, i.e. the same thing. So the people, the papers who have been shortlisted, the top papers in this particular uh, category. 
So the first one is um, synthesis crystal structure and antibacterial activity of new highly functionalized ionic compounds based on the imidazole nucleus. This is from uh, Jamiat Qasamtina. So well done to them for this honorable mention. Uh, from the same lab, we had another paper which made it to the top in chemical sciences, and this is a reaction of carbon disulfide, disulfide with two bromomoimidosalium salts. We really need the chemist to be <laughs> pronouncing these things. Novel bicyclic uh, mesoinic. Do you want to say the rest? <laughs> Again, from the same lab, which is very impressive, uh, two papers in the top uh, papers in this category. Well done to them. <laughs> from the same lab again, actually, three papers in the top uh, 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 papers in this category: synthesis of new three heteroaryl two phenylalanines and their pharmacological activity as antimicrobial agents. Well done to them for this honorable mention. So, this is really well done to them. So this is the same lab, three papers from the same lab from Santana. Very impressive indeed. And the final uh, honorable mention for chemical sciences, um, antimicrobial activity and phytochemical screening of Arbutus unido from Tlemcen. Well done to them for this honorable mention. And now, the winners of the 2014 Algerian Paper of the Year Awards in Chemical Sciences is Design, Synthesis, and Anticoagulant Activity of New Flexible Calyx 8 Arin Sulfonic Acids. Uh, this is from the University of uh, Xantina and, and GJ with collaborations from uh, Morocco. Well done to them for this win. I'm going to try to establish Dr. Zahia Kabush. Assalamu alaikum. Mabrook alik Sayyida Zahia Kabush ala hadil al the 2014 Algerian Paper of the Year Award in Chemical Sciences is yours. How do you feel about this win? Again, Mubarak Alik for this uh, deserved win. Qayyim Ana, Dr. Yusuf Mahalo is going to comment on your uh, paper. Tfadal Yusuf. So, uh, again, uh, Mubarak Alik Zahia, your paper that won was the design synthesis anticoagulant activity of a new flexible calyx 8 iron sulfonic acids. Can you recognize it? She's offline. Yeah. She's here. Good. So uh, I actually really like this paper as, 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 as someone who's got a chemistry background. It's always interesting to see a scientist is working with a new class of molecules. Yeah? It's quite, it becoming quite boring. People are always working with the small synthetic molecules. These guys, they're working with molecules that are very similar. Uh, I would call them nanographenes. Yeah? So you, if you have a graphene, this uh, wonder material that people are talking about, which is a benzene sheet, which is like this, just one layer of benzene all the way, She's making what we call rings. So she takes benzene rings and she attaches them to each other, eight of them, to make a ring. Okay, just one layer, just going around and making it uh, like a ring. And what should they try to do? Uh, other people in the field they're using this kind of molecules to use them to deliver anti-cancer compounds or antiviral compounds. What she's trying to do in their work in this paper, they took that ring and they tried to modify the chemistry of it. And what I really liked about it, they did not go and look at anti-cancer or antiviral. They actually focused on the anticoagulant activity. And this actually gave them a niche. Okay? They went somewhere where nowhere else is actually going with this class of molecules. Okay? If they went for anti-cancer, anti-antiviral, anti other people are doing it. 
So they modified it. They went for anticoagulant activity. The compounds that they had are quite good. Uh, they, uh, they need to a lot of improvement in terms of biological activity, but it's very nice. The class of molecule was really good. The application of anticoagulant activity is very good. And what also even more impressive is coupling the design and synthesis to the biological activity. You will find a lot of researchers, even here in the UK, they publish synthetic papers, they make compounds. We made them and they put them in the freezer or they just leave them, okay? But these guys, it's very nice to see that they couple their synthesis through collaborations, obviously, to go and explore the biological activity. So overall, I think it's an excellent paper. It's actually, uh, looking at all the other papers, I think is very deserving winner of this, uh, of this category. So, uh, well done. So we're going to move on to physical sciences. Um, lots of excitement in the room. Very understandable. Let's look at physical sciences and mathematics, right? The top um, shortlisted. The first honorable mention we have uh, a paper from uh, a co collaboration between uh, Tipaza and Betna, researchers from Tipaza and Betna. And it's experimental investigation of new biocomposite with low cost for thermal uh, insulation. So well done to them for this honorable mention. <laughs> Next one up, parabolic um, true solar thermal power plant potential and projects development in Algeria. This is a paper from researchers at the University of Oxenplena. Well done to them for this honorable mention. <laughs> Uh, design and realization of um, novel sun tracking system with absorber displacement for uh, parabolic tro trough collectors. Uh, collaborations between three universities, Gardaya, Algiers, and Betna. Very well done to them for this honorable mention. <laughs> A review of studies on central receiver solar thermal power plants. Uh, Researchers from the University of Algiers, well done to them for this honorable mention. <laughs> and finally, in this case, I should mention we had uh, uh, a top six rather than top five in this category. So we have five honorable mentions and one winner. The uh, fifth honorable mention is a paper entitled uh, Polypyrrole Covered MnO2 as Electrode Material for Super Capacitor. And this is from the University of Staif. Well done to them for this honorable mention. And so we come to the winner. The top paper for this year, so the winner of the 2014 Algerian Paper of the Year Awards in Physical Science and Mathematics uh, is suspense. New co-spray way to synthesize high quality. Is that Dennis? What's that? Zinc sulfide films. This is from the uh, universities of Jijil, uh, Bjaya, Algiers, and Constantine. Collaboration between four universities. Very well done for this win to them. <laughs> the first author. Dr. Yazid Buznid. Salamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Buznid. You are the winner of the 2014 Algerian Paper of the Year Award in Physical Sciences and Mathematics. Congratulations. Thanks, thanks a lot, thanks. Mubarak Ali, do you have anything to say about this, uh, this one? How do you feel? Mahwa <laughs> Shaurik. You didn't understand me very well. What's your wish for this fund to be able to get a better grade in physics and mathematics? Well, I think it's very important I should speak in English, shall I? How do you feel about this win, Dr. Buznid? Okay, Alish, after uh, Dr. Hani, you're going to give us a short comment on this winning, winning paper. Mabarak Ali, one more time. Um, Mabarak Ali, Dr. Yazid. Buznid. Yazid Buznid. Um, uh, just a few comments. يعني, وش, uh, I think, what should I do with this paper? I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm 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 going
جيجل الجيريا بجاية قسنطينة يعني شغل everyone got together to produce something which is uh, which is quite novel and, and interesting which there the paper had actual new method of synthesizing uh, a new uh, a film this film is called zinc sulfide it's quite an important film it's used in mini solar cells it's used in mini solar cells uh, and it has uh, interesting fun fun functional properties to to, to um, increase the um, uh, the output uh, from from the solar cell itself, and it can be it can be used as for different solar cells. It used in different ways, so it can be a buffer, it can be a, a, an IR coating, uh, and so forth. Uh, but what they have done is that they synthesized this material using a new technique, which is called the cool spray um, uh, method, where they actually mix the reactant while they are in the vapor phase, and then. Uh, uh, this, uh, deposited them on, on the substrate. The uh, comment that I have here is that we, for example, in the Gazer or in the Namia, these things are hard to do. Because you can synthesize these materials. For example, in the talk that I have on solar uh, multi-junction solar cells, the way you build these layers is very extremely complicated, and uh, you need machines, uh, highly sophisticated machines, to do that. Um, but I can see that in Algeria we are starting to develop, you know, some of that capability, starting from uh, uh, this example, which is uh, zinc sulfide. Um, and the other thing they've done is a nice study of its properties. So they looked at once they grew the material, once they synthesized the material, they looked at the properties, uh, its crystalline properties uh, using X-rays. They looked at the optical properties of the material. Uh, the band gap, they determined the band gap. So they did a, a really thorough analysis of the of the quality of the material they achieved using this new uh, co-spray uh, method. So I congratulate them for the win and also for the um, analysis in the paper. Congratulations to our winners. Uh, we're going to have a, a, a break now. Uh, so we're going to go off, have some a bit of refreshments. When we come back, we're going to have a second session two talks and announcements of the winners in computer science and engineering and in medicine, pharmacy, and veterinary, sci veterinary sciences. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Uh, okay, I think we should make a start for the second session, inshallah. Uh, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Abdurzaq Sultani. Uh, well, I'm uh, a member of the Ainasr.org group and uh, an editor in Inspire magazine. And uh, in this afternoon, we're going to have two sessions. Uh, well, it's, uh, it's actually one session with two presentations. The first on the, in the field of computer, computer science and engineering. And the second uh, will be on medicine, pharmacy, and veterinary sciences. Uh, the first talk we're going to have is going to be presented by Dr. Abdeljani Ben Nasser, uh, PhD in Optical Communications from Cambridge University, and he is now a lecturer in Northampton University. And the talk will be titled "Reliability of Manual Ultrasonic Non-Destructive Testing." Okay. I'd like to share some thoughts about my uh, research topic. So it's not a research presentation; it's rather research. Um, uh, thoughts that I would like to share about my um, about related to my research. So Algeria infrastructure landscape is rapidly changing. Uh, we know that new motorways have been built, tall buildings are erected, and also old and uh, new um, oil and gas pipelines need maintenance. For this reason, I suppose these structures require testing to test their fitness for service. So my topic will be about this um, a very well established technique. It's called manual ultrasonic non-destructive testing and its reliability. So we're all familiar with pyramids in Egypt or the Great Wall of China or even the Tower of Pisa, which is leaning but never falling. Um, these structures transcend time, but we may be forgiven to think that they could last forever. Unfortunately, uh, structures age over time, experience fatigue to become totally obsolete, like the picture on the top uh, left, where you can see the motorway almost um, becoming unusable. Uh, 
The bottom right picture shows a decommissioned uh, military aircraft at the end of its service. So there is also another mechanism. Uh, cracks can also initiate in different structures due to loading, environment factors, or otherwise the cracks grow and propagate. And they pose a substantial risk of failure. Without proper checks, um, failure, catastrophic failures can occur, which may lead to tragic loss of life, interruption of service, long legal investigations, as well as heavy expenses. Some of you may remember the train accident which took place in Hatfield in Hertfordshire in 2000, here in the UK. The investigation, a later investigation, revealed that a rail had fragmented as train pass. So, for this reason, NDT, or non-destructive testing, is needed is to ensure the integrity of the, uh, um, the structures. So by using sophisticated equipments and a mixture of simple and complicated techniques, it is possible to ascertain the existence of flaws in components. What we need, for example, is the accuracy. That's what we need. And as, um, just as to give you an appreciation, every year, um, hundreds of repairs are carried out in different locations after visual inspections in London and ground tunnels. So this is something that's taking um, place every time. But the face of NDT is changing. At the moment, um, less NDT is used during manufacture. Uh, it's used for non-invasive inspection, but only during service. If you look at the demand, um, they now look for risk-based inspection or fitness for service, so they don't really wait for, they don't stop at NDT, they want to see whether it's fit for service. And also, there is an, uh, new methods are always introduced, uh, for example, long-range ultrasonic techniques, um, time of travel, and other, and diffraction techniques. And for those who work in the NDT, they find that those equipment become even more complex than they are, particularly in ultrasonics. And um, the population of NDT operators are also aging, so they are not new fresh blood coming in. So using computers may, may be very challenging for them. And also the stringent training and qualification for NDT personnel. I'm going to talk about this in detail a little bit later. So the stress is that all these greater demands due to complexity, new techniques, computerized equipment, requires more training for NDT personnel without greater rewards. And that's, that's perhaps the, um, the, um, the crux of the matter. And maybe as a result, uh, very few people training for careers or taking a career path as an NDT operator. So we have a shortage of skilled NDT personnel. Now, looking at some of the methods, um, I think you've got one presentation. Anyway, so um, looking at the basic methods, there are about five. Um, in fact, now they become seven. The BINDT, the British Institute of Non-Destructive Testing, had added two more. But those are the most established techniques, from penetrant to magnetic, both of those two, but magnetic particle, are visual inspection, so they use the human eye. For the ultrasonic, an eddy current, and the radiography are the other three. By far, if we talk about volumetric inspection, ultrasonic technique provides a high flow sensitivity. So by far, this is the most used uh, technique. Just to give you a flavor, although I know this is a non-technical talk, but I'd like to give you an explanation how it works. You've got an ultrasonic probe, as you can see. A pulse is fired from the probe, is reflected off the back wall, and then is received again by the probe. What you see on the screen are two pulses, the initial pulse and the back wall echo. Now, if there is a crack, the crack constitutes 
a discontinuity in the material. So it acts as a reflector. If there is a pulse, it reflects off that crack, and you get a, um, a peak between the two peaks. And that suggests that there is a discontinuity in the, in the, in the material. So basically, this is how it works. By knowing the speed of sound in the material, which we most of the time we know, and measuring the pulse round trip time, we can calculate the distance. So there are many variations of this technique. This is known as a pulse echo, and there is also up to something that the most advanced is known as a phase array. Nevertheless, conventional manual ultrasonic still dominates. It's simple, cost-effective, and quick to deploy. <laughs> OK. I've been told that I've got only three minutes left, so I'm going to try and follow this very quickly. So this is sort of, this shows the path of an NDT operator. Um, perhaps the message to take away is how complex it is. For the aerospace industry, it takes about three years. It's almost like an undergraduate degree just to be an NDT operator. Not only that, look at the number of exams, what they need to do, the theory, the practice. They have to do a number of um, test cases before they can qualify. <clears throat> so, those methods are limited though. They can only provide whether they pass or fail. They don't tell them about the process. Also, they don't tell them whether they can sustain a good performance or even improve a poor one. Because at the end, what they look for is just they have found the, um, the, the flaws or not. So it's almost like a binary uh, pass or fail. And also, if we, if we look at the samples used, it's very expensive to cut out, to manufacture. Uh, some of them, after a, say, a structure has been decommissioned, they take samples. If we take a sample from an aircraft, a wing, that can be very large. That, that poses storage problems, for example. If it's from a power plant, sometimes they use radiography. And that means that it is hazardous, so that it could be some um, uh, radioactive elements. This is to give you a, a flavor how laborious uh, the NDT, um, <laughs> the work of an NDT operator is. They have to take some, uh, not only training in NDT, but sometimes they have to do even some uh, tests in terms of um, their ability to be at a very high height. MUT, despite its simplicity, it's suboptimal. <coughs> a number of problems. Those are trial studies that have been uh, that have taken place. The largest one is known as PISC in 1974. It finished in 2001. It's a worldwide trial study. Without exception, all of those have shown that MUT is suboptimal. In fact, the latest PANI shows that 50, around 50%. Uh, there is a probability of 50% that an operator finds a, a flaw. Mori has compiled about 59 human factors that contribute to the um, um, reliability or probably unreliability of uh, MUT, 12 of which are key and are listed here. So what is the answer? The automation? But there is no machine as dexterous as a human hand. And also, it doesn't get into very small uh, places, intricate. The other problem is, is that sometimes it's only one meter. Deploying a robot is not very cost effective. So this is an approach that um, I coordinated when I was um, um, project coordinator of a European project. So we took a different approach. Instead of looking at <laughs> Instead of looking at this, uh, the causes, the root causes, we looked at the symptoms. And that proved to be beneficial. Um, another work that we have done is the acoustic coupling. And we managed to get a 70% prediction accuracy. And we've also developed a virtual training environment. Um, but I'd like also to give you uh, a vision towards the future. So how can we make our structures last longer, be more reliable and cost-effective, making sensors integral part of the, of the structure? This is sort of the vision, so we're moving more towards from unscheduled and scheduled maintenance to predictive 
And this is a, a nice analogy, and I thank you for listening. Any questions? <laughs> Well, composites are being used more and more this day, particularly in the aerospace industry. I mean, you referred to the qualification of uh, destructive testing engineers taking almost three years. How reliable is the technology in composite materials when you said that the technology itself actually depends on the speed of sound in the material? And we know that composites are more often than not a composition of other. There is no so standard is yet. There isn't. There isn't one. It's still underway. Um, as you know, it's very complex. Um, different people have come up with different ideas. Uh, ultrasonic seems to be the way to go, uh, but it is very attenuative in composite materials. Uh, there is some work on eddy current, but in my view, it's very, very limited. Uh, what is proving quite beneficial nowadays is acoustic emission. Surprisingly, it used to be a method that is disliked by the NDT community. But in, in terms of uh, composites, if they want to uh, look at um, sort of weak points, that seemed to show some promise. But um, at, up to now, there is no standard yet. Uh, I have a question. Okay. Nice question. Yeah? yeah. No, actually, uh, I actually ha I had a question for maybe those of us uh, looking for a job, uh, what, what, what's, what do you say is the reason for the lack of the new generation NDT operational? If there is, I mean, if there is, obviously, if there's such a demand for it, why aren't there people? And if you're guaranteed a job after your three-year course, why wouldn't you do it? Not only you're guaranteed, even during your training, you're recruited, so you're paid. So not only that. The problem is, is that they work in very harsh environments. I mean, it, it's very risky. Um, in most cases, they have to um, put up with a very low reward, particularly in terms of their salary. Uh, they get sort of bonuses because they travel all over the world, obviously they go to different places, but sometimes they are sent to Alaska, sometimes to Siberia, sometimes to the um, Middle East in scorching heat. So that's something that puts them off most of the time. One more, sorry. Um, you said you mentioned those are last kind of thing, incorporating the sensors within the structure itself. Are there any real examples in today's oh, world that use oh, that kind of thing? Oh, yes. I mean, structural health monitoring, this is what, when you implement sensors. I mean, it's been in the realm of, uh, of laboratories for over a decade now. It's never, but it's, it remained confined in those spaces. The problem is, is that what you need to know about the NDT community is very, very conservative. If they want to make a change, it takes a long time, and you have to prove it. Uh, after all, they, they concern about the safety, so they can't compromise. And it happens to most of those fields where safety is a paramount um, feature. Um, but mainly because of their conservatism, nothing else. Um, I don't see a lot, of, for example, the best solution is, for example, the embed fiber of sensors. Uh, it happens in aerospace. Uh, in fact, um, because fiber sensors are expensive and only aerospace industry can afford such costs. So we only see those happening in aerospace. But at the same time, and you know fully well, you're an aerospace engineer, if they want to change a rivet, you know how long it takes. So imagine that you, you're going to embed sensors and in the full aircraft body and fuselage and all of that. So that's what, what makes it hard to... Um, penetrate. You're welcome. Thanks. Okay. Our next guest is Dr. Hanan Ali Busetta, PhD in nanomedicine and drug delivery systems from the School of Pharmacy, which is part of University College London uh, now, and she's currently a lecturer in Birmingham University. Thank you. Thanks for a generous introduction and nice to be here today. Thanks for the invite as well. I hope I can keep you uh, 
awake. It's the last talk, so it's a challenge for me um, today. So I'm going to talk to you about something different. I'm going to talk to you about exploring um, the nano world, but in medicine. So we're not, I'm not an engineer, so we're going to look at it from a medicine perspective. So we're going to talk about the nano world. What's the nano world? What do we hear about um, when we hear the term nano? I'm going to introduce you to the field of my research, which is nanomedicine and drug delivery. And then we're going to talk about some drug delivery system and why actually we want to explore those nanomaterials in medicine. So the nano world. So what is actually nano? So nano, nanometers. Anybody knows what nano is? For the engineers in the audience. So that's one billionth, so nanometer is one billionth of a meter, or 10 to the minus 9 of a meter. So that's something very, very small. You can't potentially see it by the naked eye. However, in every kind of um, everyday life, we hear the word nano. Where do you actually hear the word nano? Do you, anything in particular that comes with the word nano in mind? Yeah, nanotechnology. So we've got iPad nano, and it has the word nano in it. We also, um, when you hear the word nano, we talk about um, um, science fiction movies, so Fantastic Voyage, and I would recommend people to look at that. That's when they try to um, engineer some kind of uh, um, um, vectors to go and cure something in the body. So that's a kind of science fiction movie. And you, uh, guess what? There is also a car that's called Tata Nano. However, these are not really in the nano scale. They are actually larger. You can see them. They're bigger. So when we're talking about nano in the nanotechnology world, we're talking about things in the nanometer. So if you think, take DNA for instance, it's about which is our genetic material. That's about 2.5 um, nanometer. So if you compare it to bacteria, bacteria is about 2.5 micrometer, while a large raindrop is about 2.5 millimeter. So you can actually see it by the naked eye. We take another example that probably some engineers here would know about. These are single wall carbon nanotubes. They are usually used as um, um, electrical conductors. Um, and these, if you think about them, they are um, single wall carbon nanotube, they are about one nanometer in diameter. They're actually about um, 100 times thinner than actually human hair. So if you think that human hair is thin, there's actually things that are thinner than that. So that's actually the nano in terms of nanotechnology and in its proper um, meaning. So now we go into nanomedicine. So what's nanomedicine? It's actually where my, why I got my title is trying to explore nano, the nano world in medicine. So there are a lot of publication, a lot of work is actually being done in nanomedicine. Um, it's the medical application of nanotechnology. It's trying, what we're trying to do is trying to engineer basically um, and apply some nanoscale based material um, to, um, and then um, use their properties to actually achieve best patient intervention. In other words, we are exploring the nanomaterials, but in medicine rather than engineering. However, when we talk about nanomedicine, we can't really not talk about drug delivery. So drug delivery as a term, what I'm trying to do today with you is kind of try to deconstruct that term. What does it really mean for non-pharmacists or non-people who are not working in drug delivery in particular? So we'll, let's take the two words separate. So if we start with delivery, so I've got here some pictures for you. So, um, and I'm trying to see if you can spot up what is common between those pictures. So we've got, we got pizza, food, we've got a baby, we've got a parcel. Anything common in there? Huh? Something coming out of it? Something, anything else? Hmm? A messenger? Yeah, yeah. We're, huh? Protecting, yes. So we also talk about, if you think, it's all about delivering something. So we're delivering a pizza in this case, we're delivering a baby in this case, and we're delivering a parcel. So we're also talking about time when we're talking about delivery. So we've got standard delivery, we've got next day delivery, or nine month delivery in case of a baby. So in terms of delivery in general, it's actually what we, a specific material um, for this, in this case, food or a parcel, is actually transported and delivered to you in that case as a recipient or to your home um, at a specific time. So there is a packaging that's either used to protect something or to deliver. There is a transportation mechanism in getting involved. There is also a release at a specific time. 
So now we looked at delivery in kind of a general sense. Let's look at the meaning of a drug. You might know all what a drug means. You know the word, you know ibuprofen, you know paracetamol. Doxorubicin is an anti-cancer drug commonly used and commonly prescribed to treat cancer. So a drug is a molecule that is actually capable um, of interacting with biological component to give you a response. Whether this response is to treat your headache, or whether this response is to treat someone's cancer, that's what you want. However, what you also want for a drug is actually to be specific and that's mainly because you don't want side effects. That's very important when you're talking about cancer patients um, as we discussed uh, earlier on. So in nanomedicine drug delivery we, if we take those together what we're trying to do is to, um, to have a drug, a drug can be any molecule um, or a group of molecule that we wish to deliver. We want to deliver it um, at some specific site in the body, example the tumour, and for a therapeutic we want to get a therapy out of it or we want to diagnose, so we want to diagnose and to see where the cancer is in the body, or to actually achieve theranostic application. Something which is very interesting about nanomedicine drug delivery is that you actually can do the, the two things together. You can actually um, do a diagnostic, deliver a diagnostic, at the same time you can deliver your drug. So again, if we take what we have in nanomedicine drug delivery, is that drug molecules are actually packaged, um, transported, and released at a specific time and a specific site. So if we take these, uh, the orange dots here are your drug. We actually have in here a package. And when you're injected it in a human body, for instance, you actually want your drug only to get into the tumor site, here shown in gray. Yeah, so you want that specific specificity as well. So the packaging, um, by which a drug is actually delivered to the disease at site is as important as the drug itself. It's not only the drug that we care about, we want also to care about how is it packaged, how does it deliver your drug. So, and the way we do that is actually by using uh, what we know as drug delivery systems. In the nanomedicine, in the nano world, we actually use nanomaterials as our drug delivery systems and we also call them nanovectors. So why do we use a drug delivery system in general? So kind of highlighted, we want basically to deliver a therapeutic molecule, a diagnostic molecule um, um, to their site of action. We want to encapsulate a drug inside um, our drug delivery system. So for instance, here we have carbon nanotube and we have a radioisotope that we want to deliver to treat cancer, or you actually can um, conjugate to a drug, in this case a midotrixate, another anti-cancer drug that you want to deliver specifically to the tumor site. We also want to use it to um, we want also to use it to reduce um, side effect again. If you want, um, if you want it to be uh, specific and targeted, that's what will happen. You actually reduce side effect. You also can reduce drug resistance. And also um, with chemistry, a lot of the molecules that chemists are making are actually quite potent. However, may, one of the main problems is their solubility. Or another problem that um, Yusuf mentioned previously is that they can't get into the cells. So you actually can use drug delivery system, and you can use na nanomaterials to deliver those drugs in inside your cell. By doing so, you're actually altering how the drug is distributed in the body. So you're actually enhancing its specificity to the site of action, if we think about cancer, or enhancing its targeting. So in what we do, um, or what we do um, uh, in nanomedicine again, is we try to explore the use of nanomaterials in, med um, in medicine. So my lab, for instance, we're concentrating on um, using nanomaterial for cancer therapy, again, to achieve targeted and specific delivery. We also concentrate on your degenerative disorders. One of the main problems as well is getting drugs into the brain. So nanomaterials have shown exciting um, um, uh, results so that they can actually, some of them can cross the blood brain barrier and more work is actually being um, done to look at um, uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. We also use nanomaterial for imaging and diagnosis. As you can see here, this is the mice, and we can actually see the view the liver um, be, um, uh, using radioactivity or a drug of radioactive material encapsulated inside nanotubes. And interestingly enough, we also look at nanotoxicology. You will hear that nano is actually we, you will hear the word um, that nano is actually um, toxic, but that's also have a side and um, a, a side to it the, to the story. So we actually look at whether this nanomaterial that we're using is toxic, and what we try to do as well is try to engineer it to make it non-toxic by functionalizing it by involving chemists into the the, the, the game, if I say that. 
So the beauty of nanomedicine is that it's an interface between different fields. It's an interface between chemistry, it's an interface between engineering, between biology and pharmacology. So in nanomedicine we actually go from looking at um, um, uh, molecules and drugs and conjugating them to nanomaterials into in vitro cell work, into in vivo animal experiments, basically. So that's again just to highlight, and that's just kind of an overview of some of the papers or some of the graphical abstracts from the papers um, that I uh, was involved with, and some also of um, um, kind of covers of the articles or the journals that the research was highlighted. Thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. And it's time for three questions, please. Yes. Are there any restrictions to drug size that can be um, incorporated in nanoparticle or any other sort of chemical restrictions? Uh, no, there is no. Basically, you can deliver from small molecules onto cancer drugs, very small molecules, to actually macromolecules, proteins, peptides, and um, um, uh, DNA, for instance, nucleic and DNA and small interference RNA. So there is uh, no uh, restriction in terms of what size you can uh, you can actually achieve. And there is a lot of work actually that has been doing done on gene therapy, where a DNA material is actually being delivered using nanomaterial and uh, drug delivery systems. Um, I'm more interested in the nanomaterial itself because mm. it, it helps you, it helps the drug target the site where it wants to go. Okay. Okay, so um, if you think, if we think about, if we t I'll take give you an example about cancer, for instance. Um, cancer um, structure or cancer cells or well, the morphology is actually leaky. You've got leaky vasculature. So the nanomaterials, it's you got kind of get about 200 nanometer diameter between the blood vessels. So it's completely different structure from the normal um, blood vessels. So you, we use that to actually enhance. So we use the nanomaterial and you know, we use those characteristics to enhance and to get the drug. We can also, what we also do is actually add a targeting ligand as well. So we target it with antibodies as well to make it even more specific. So we've got a platform. So we're using the nanomaterial as a platform where you're actually putting a drug, putting um, uh, um, uh, an antibody for instance, a targeting ligand, using the properties of the nanoparticles to actually target the tumor. There's also other work for instance with carbon nanotube that they actually can absorb um, light and they can heat up. So they can actually do um, cause what we call high Hypothermia, so they can they just kill the cells um, by um, heating up. So again, and some other uh, nanop nanoparticles do have that characteristic. So again, there are certain intrinsic characteristics of nanoparticles that we can use um, uh, in our advantages, basically. Yes. yes. Out of interest, can they also be used externally as in topically as well? Uh, there are, so, yeah, there are some uh, work that has been done, you mean in kind of um, in uh, uh, creams. Yes, there are. In fact, if um, some of the creams actually do have uh, nanomaterials on them already, so it, it will be, um, if you look at some, you can actually find out that some are uh, with nanomaterials and then the problem is started whether they are actually toxic or not and it opens up a big issue. So yes, you can potentially. They have certain problems. Nanotube, for instance, can also get into the cells or cross the plasma membrane without going into endocytosis, so it goes um, cell penetration straight away. So there are advantages that we can also use for, uh, for instance, skin delivery, if you're interested in that. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, now we move to the next part, which is to announce the winners in the two fields. Uh, uh, the first is in computer science and engineering. As uh, Yusuf pointed out in uh, the beginning of this uh, conference, there were 62, we received 62 different papers in, in uh, the fields of computer, computer science and engineering. And the, one of the uh, shortlisted ones we received from the University of Bijaya, uh, titled Performance and Efficiency Control Enhancement of Wind Power Generation, System based on DFIG using three level sparse matrix converter. So, a round of applause, please, for the nominated paper. The second was titled Phase Current Reconstruction using a single current sensor of three phase AC motors fed by SVM controlled direct matrix converters. Thank you. And a round of applause for him.
The third uh, nominated paper was no reference blur image quality uh, measure based on multiplicative uh, or multi-resolution decomposition uh, from University of Algiers. <laughs> so congratulations to them. And the last one was from a concerted uh, effort from three different universities, or two actually, from Skikda and Borj Baji Mukhtar. And it was titled Reliability of the DCM SVM in Losses Minimization of Wind Conversion Chain Output Inverter. Oh, there is one more. <laughs> uh, and it was from University of Wahran, uh, titled Road Traffic Density Estimation Using Microscopic and Macroscopic Parameters. So a round of applause for both papers, please. <laughs> and the winner of uh, this year's uh, best paper in computer science and engineering is written by the group led by uh, Maryam Bouhamid. And the title of the paper is Moving Objects Localization by Local Regions Based Level Set Application on Urban Traffic. So a round of applause for the best paper. Yeah. Do we? Yeah. Hello? Hello? Assalamu alaikum, Maryam. I'm Aki Abdul Razak, Audu Ful Farik Dai Nasser.org. Elf Elf Mabrook for Injaz Mumayas and for the award for best paper. Madabina Tatin Al Al Intibat Dak, who that Ay Tali Kula Mukhtarah, Allah Al Injaz. Yeah, I like it. Maryam Boumahd. Alf, alf, mabrook again. Ah, yes. Alhamdulillah, thank you for the support of the work and the development of the work. I want to thank all the members of the team for this project. I mean, the work that will serve all the members and the members of the team. I mean, the members of the team. يعني يقوم بهذا العمل يعني شيء مشرف لكل الجزائريين يعني أود شكر يعني شكركم أنتم بالذات يعني يعطيك الصحة ليلى ألف ألف مبروك أجان and now جليل جليل اللي سكنا offers comments إن شاء الله and impressions on the paper سلام مريم مبروك عليك مرة أخرى أول شيء نقدم لك برك ال reviewer comments اللي كان على paper تاعك. The authors present a method for finding moving objects in videos using a single fixed camera, and there are two stages to the system, which we identify as detection process and also a localization process. What we would like to highlight is the contribution. So it's a new energy function. And it's based on image patches uh, around the object contours. Um, another contribution is the evolution of the contours, the control of that. And what is good beyond the published data is the application. Uh, if we consider urban traffic and the level or the number of accidents that have taken place in Algeria, although the application or the prospects of that are remote, um, it's still an interesting topic uh, to work on. Uh, moving objects is very, very uh, attractive. And I congratulate you and the rest of the team. Uh, okay, now we move to the uh, next section, which is uh, the nominations for best paper in the fields of medicine, pharmacy, and veterinary sciences. Uh, there was a pool of, uh, we received a total of 34 papers uh, this year, which was uh, an increase of about 30%. And the nominated pa uh, papers are uh, ex vivo immunomodulatory effects of all transretinoic acid during Bassett's disease, a study in Algerian uh, patients, and received a paper from university uh, in Algiers. So congratulations to them. 
Uh, the second paper was received from a university in Wahran, and the title was A Simple and Accessible Screening Method for Congenital Thrombopathies Using an Impedance Hematology Counter. So congratulations to the group. Uh, the third was titled Evaluation of Healing Activity of PVA Ketosan Hydrogels on Deep Second Degree Bump Pharmacological and Toxical Toxicological Tests from Algiers, so congratulations to them. And last uh, but not least, uh, a combined effort from uh, two universities from Tlemcen and Wahran on a paper titled Association Analysis of IL-10 TNF-alpha, IL-23L, IL-1RB2 SMPs, wow, with basis disease risk in Western Algeria. So many congratulations to them. And the winner of uh, this year's award is a paper titled Oral Delivery of Insulin from Alginate Ketosan Crosslinked by Glutaraldehyde, written by the group led by uh, Jamal Tahtat. So many, many congratulations to the group. So do we have Jamal? Okay, so we're trying to see. Probably we can offer comments in the meantime. Oh. Okay. Okay. Hello. Salam alaikum, Sir Jamal. مرحبا بك معك عبد الرزاق عضو في الفريق تاع اينصر.org اولا الف الف مبروك على الفوز تاعكم على الانجاز المتميز في البحث العلمي نتا والفريق تاعك الله يسلمك ماذا بك تخبرنا ماذا هي الانطباعات تاعك واي تعليق على هذا الفوز انعم ايه يعطيك الصحة سي جمال ان شاء الله الله يبارك فيك يعطيك الصحة ان شاء الله راح نقدم لك دكتور علي بوسيتا راح تعطيك تعليق على البحث العلمي تاعك اوكي شكرا شكرا دكتور تحتات والف مبروك مرة ثانية على الجائزة um, I'm going to just give you kind of a brief introduction to everybody else in here about the work so um, so again just well, so again, the overview of the paper of the year. So it talks about insulin. It was really good relation to our first speaker today. So insulin, as we discussed and discovered today, is actually a peptide hormone. Um, it regulates carbohydrate and plaque metabolism in our body. Um, it's basically in, mainly in type 1 diabetes, where patients actually have a destruction of the beta cells in pancreas that we actually give uh, insulin to patients. Um, and basically the main way of giving insulin is via an injectable dosage form. So as you can see here, um, the patient here is actually injecting themselves with insulin. However, one of the main problems with injectable dosage form in general and in insulin in particular is that there is a low patient compliance. The patients don't want to inject themselves either before, because of fear or because of discomfort on injection. So one might think of why, don't we, why can't we actually deliver insulin orally? We can't actually do that because it's a um, peptide, as we said. It actually gets degraded by a proteolytic enzyme and also the acidic environment in the stomach. It also has a low penetration, so it can't really go across the lining of the intestine where the absorption of the drugs usually occur. So what our colleagues in Algeria, led by Dr. Tahtat, all basically have tried to do is actually make a new formulation or a new dosage form. So they try to encapsulate this fully absorbable insulin into kind of um, some um, beads or um, uh, particles. 
So what they use, they use natural polymers, which are actually used pharmaceutically, proven pharmaceutically. They are biodegradable, they are non-toxic, and, and also biocompatible. And those two main ones was um, alginate, which is um, uh, an anionic or a negatively charged polymer, um, and chitosone, which is a cationic polymer. So they've used the alginate because it has a pH sensitivity. So what happens is it's stable at the acidic, um, um, acidic uh, pH of the stomach, where we don't want our insulin to be degraded. However, it dissolves in the intestinal alkaline uh, pH, which is a great, great for what we want or what they wanted, basically. Um, also, chitosan is a cationic, and it has also been used quite a lot in drug delivery and in gene therapy, for instance, because of its cationic properties, but also because it has mucoadhesive properties. So because the cell membranes are negatively charged, having something cationic charge or cationic will, make, um, will prolong the interaction uh, with the epithelial membrane, especially in the intestine. And they've used also glutaraldehyde um, as another organic compound in there to improve the mechanical properties. So looking at the paper overall, what they have made, they made those beautiful um, beads, as they call them. They look like a tablet that you can take. Um, and looking at that, the way they've done and they looked at into the research, they had a very beautiful full characterization of the beads. I was really impressed and amazed with the techniques that they actually have in Algeria, some of which sometimes it's hard to get hold in the UK universities even. So you've got a TAR, um, SACHET scan and electron microscopy as well, and others which I'm not showing. Later on, once they prepared their beads, they actually asked the question, do those beads actually swallow, um, swell in simulated gastric fluid and inter uh, simulated intestinal fluid? They tried to mimic what happens in the stomach and the intestine. Side, and so they use it as stimulated fluid. And they ask the question, do they actually swell? And that's an important question because you want to get, you have your insulin inside, but does it actually get out? And to get out, you need those kind of cross-linked polymers to actually swallow and open up. And they actually did uh, find out that one of their formulations actually swallows very well, and more interestingly, that it actually happens in the intestinal fluid, in the place that we actually want our insulin to be delivered. We don't want it to be swallowed and to get released here. However, this question didn't actually answer the question, is insulin actually getting out of the, those beads? So they actually asked that question and tried to, um, uh, to answer it. So can insulin be released from the beads? So Dr. Sahtat, they all looked at the um, cumulative release of insulin, again in the simulated gastric fluid and simulated intestinal fluid, and they found out that it actually it does actually um, um, go out. It, it is actually released, and they showed that when they quantitatively um, calculated that, it was around um, 300 international um, insulin units, which is quite kind of uh, in a good range of what we, uh, you need to have. The last kind of question, which was also important, which relates to having chitosan as a cationic um, uh, polymer there, is do the particles adhere to the biological tissue? Remember that we said insulin actually have a poor penetration to the intestinal fluid? So they actually asked that question, and they found out that about 90 to 95% of those beads adhere to the mucosal surface of the rat intestine in vitro. So it was, it was a very, as I would conclude here, it was a very systematic work, very well written and structured paper. And again, and one of the biggest things with it is actually its therapeutic potential. So once again, congratulations to Fatat um, all in Algeria. First of all, the, uh, the winners of the Al 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 2014 Algerian Paper of the Year Awards are going to receive these, uh, in my opinion, beautiful uh, plaques together with uh, certificates that will go to every uh, author uh, on the paper. Uh, so we're going to be shipping these over uh, to Algeria in the next coming days. Um, the next two things that we're going to do after these awards, we're going to produce a full report, uh, just like we did last year, uh, about the, award ex uh, the awards experience. So the report is going to have uh, the details about the process, the details about the stats that we talked about earlier, uh, but also um, uh, other things like financial uh, aspects of uh, covering for this uh, for this awards and whatnot. The next thing that we're going to do is we're going to interview or invite the winners for exclusive interviews with Inspire magazine, uh, and hopefully explore in more depth the details of their contributions uh, in their papers. And and this means that hopefully we expose their work more, reach a wider audience, and we learn and discover something interesting that our colleagues in Algeria are doing. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, then there is the, come Yusuf, tell us about the 2015 uh, awards, um, which is, uh, you know, this initiative is looking good, so we're going to continue to do so. 
and Yusuf will tell us about what's going to happen next uh, year. So uh, we've done the 2013, the first edition, the 2014. The number of nominations per paper is actually increasing. So we've got a 34% increase in number of nominations. What's also very impressive, as I highlighted initially, is that we got papers around 32 universities in, 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 in Algeria. So the aim is to keep, go, keep going again. For 2015, so the, uh, the nomination call will be open around early January 2000 and, uh, and, uh, and for 2015. And uh, what we try to do then, we'll just look at the papers published in 2014 and we consider them for next year's award. Uh, we have a number of challenges. I don't know if you've got slides, but uh, that's coming up late. So um, we received a lot of uh, comments and a lot of feedback from people asking us to cover social sciences, for example, to cover economics, OK? Because right now, we're only looking at uh, chemistry, uh, pharmacy and medicine, physical sciences, computer science and engineering, uh, and biological sciences. And there's a lot of pressure on us, I have to say, from a lot of uh, academics in Al Jazeera to actually look uh, particularly social sciences and, uh, and the economics, for example. The, we initially thought we would do that for the 2015 awards, but it looks unlikely right now. And this is simply because we don't have really the right expertise in our uh, awards committee actually to look after economics and, and, and social sciences. So we're looking for volunteers. If there are some volunteers with background in economics or social sciences who are willing to join us and to add a new discipline to the, to the, com to the awards, for 2015, we're more than happy. So we, we welcome, we welcome any, anyone who comes to join us. And as I said, I always say to apologize because we did not exclude social science and economics because we think they are not important. It's actually the opposite. For me, I think they are probably the essence for me. You know, they need, they need to be in such an award. We need actually to, uh, to, to support those disciplines too. So we are happy to include them in 2015 providing that we've got the support some people to join us in the awards committee have got expertise to, to to in, in those disciplines. Uh, as well as that, we, we find it quite a challenging when we get a lot of papers. For example, in physical sciences and engineering, we have 75 papers. And for us to go from 75 to the top five papers, we actually need to look quite a number of people to look at those 75 papers. And it's quite, um, it's quite hard to give it to one or two people, give them 75 papers, and ask them to choose this, the, the, the top five. You know. Uh, people have been uh, excellent for us, and this actually uh, gives me the opportunity to thank people who helped us for the shortlisting and reviewing because they've done a fantastic job. Some of them, they had to go through the 75 papers, for example, physical science engineering, and choose the top five. And I really applaud them for that, as well as the other shortlisting. So anyone who's interested in shortlisting or reviewing, please get in touch with us. Uh, we are always looking for people to help. And you could do as much as you want to do. We are not going to tell you what to do. But if you say, we could, I could review 10 papers or shortlist 10 papers, just get in touch with us and that will be enough. Every little helps, OK? This motto is stolen from another company, but for this meeting, it's OK. <laughs> so uh, as I said, 2014 is pretty much done. The awards, we know who the winners are. We'll get in touch with them, and we'll do what Sam uh, mentioned. Uh, we're looking forward to 2015. To the people who are here, to the people who are watching this uh, live stream, Get ready your papers, publish a lot of papers, good papers in 2014, and submit them next year. We'll be looking forward to them. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, 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 go ahead. Uh, no, so the reviewers this year, actually, that's the question. So the reviewers uh, this year we had 22 different reviewers reviewing, uh, in depending on their discipline. Uh, they are not in Algeria. We don't, and as long, we, we actually prefer that they are not in Algeria to actually even. Um, for a number of reasons, uh, and even to actually make it more, more. Uh, for example, this year we had uh, we had reviewers from uh, California, from uh, one biotech company, in California. We had someone from University of San Austin, Texas. We had uh, people from uh, United Arab Emirates. We had uh, people from Dundee. We had Cardiff. We had uh, we had uh, London Metropolitan University here. So we're trying to make it a little bit more of international, give it a touch of flavor in terms of the, at the review in the stage. And initially, people might be a little bit apprehensive, thinking, oh, sending Algerian these type of papers to those high-caliber reviewers, they might look, at the, look down on them. But you will be surprised. You go, the feedback that comes back from them is really impressive. I mean, well, I'm going to take one minute longer. But I'll give you an example. One of the reviewers, he actually loved some of the chemistry papers. He reviewed the chemistry for us. And he sent an email. So he submitted his scores, but he sent an email to say the chemistry papers were really high, high standard. 
And he said he's going to use some of the some of the papers for his second year teaching of chemistry. He actually is going to use some of the content. So uh, for the for the review, we want them to be from outside Algeria, uh, preferably uh, people uh, at at a senior level. Okay, because that way we know that the papers go through a very rigorous inter uh, review and process as well. It's the same story for for all of them. So the twenty two. Yeah, all, all included. Yeah, we have we have. Uh, Okay, I'll be in touch with you before you get in touch with so us. Don't worry. We're going to be opening the call for uh, for viewers. It's probably going to be the entire time. Anybody can suggest. Yeah. Yeah. The reviewers depend on the short piece of paper. Well, that that is true to an extent, but you know, for the short listing, for example, this year, our criteria is that every paper has to be either shortlisted by a minimum of three people or reviewed by a minimum of three people. A paper that's not reviewed by a minimum of three people will not consider it. Uh, we're trying to give it a little bit of a quality and, and uh, we make it a little bit uh, robust, the whole process. So minimum of three. We, it's been, we had some cases where uh, people in physical science and engineering, uh, some of them are here, they had to go through 64 papers because we don't have more reviewers or people to do the short listing. And thankfully enough, they've done that for us, which we are very grateful for. Yeah. Okay. So, so before you get ready to leave, I have uh, just a few things to say. Um, so essentially, I think what we've um, oops, what we've uh, witnessed today is pretty much what anasr.org is trying to do, i.e., uh, bl building bridges between researchers in Algeria and in the UK. Um, um, and we try to do this in various ways: the Algerian Paper of the Year Award, and today's event. They sort of uh, various different presentations which are related to different disciplines uh, and so on, uh, you know, push towards that in, the, in that direction. Um, so I'm just going to tell you and everybody who, everyone who's uh, watching us how, if you want, if you, if you um, uh, kind of your, your vision of what we should be done about Algerian science uh, aligns with, with ours, i.e. building a, a strong community, what can you do, how can you contribute? These are just a few suggestions of what uh, can be done or what you can do right now. You can join the network on our website, become a member. Um, you can, you know, use that website, give us suggestions of how we can improve um, uh, that website. Inspire Magazine, where we're going to be publishing the uh, interviews, is also, uh, uh, we think, is an important resource that you can use. It. Well, you can read it, but you can also write for it. Anybody is welcome to send us articles um, that we can publish. Uh, there are plans to, at the moment, this is only in English, and it's only online, but there are plans to hopefully uh, translated into Arabic and maybe have some physical copies distributed in Algerian schools, for example. So Inspire Magazine is all about uh, outreach, is all about making science accessible to uh, everybody. Donations uh, is, is another thing that you can do. Uh, like I said, today's event, the awards, the, uh, the shipment, everything that you see here is sponsored by the community. Some of you have already donated. There is a, rav a raffle going on, so you can still uh, donate. So keep an eye if you wish to support us through donations, then please do so. Um, and finally, we're really open to uh, your suggestions. There's an email you can uh, get in touch with, but you can also get in touch with us through Facebook or LinkedIn or Google+. Plus. We, we are all on all those things. So info at anasr.org for any ideas or suggestions. We have a few things which we're going to be doing in the next six months or so. Uh, we're going to be spending some time on the website, uh, on uh, revamping it, making it look a bit nice and a bit more uh, usable. Um, so if you are into web development, particularly in, in Drupal and WordPress, we'd like to hear from you. Um, there's uh, three people on the editorial team of uh, Inspire magazine, but if, you, if you're into that, if you're into uh, editing articles or recruiting writers and following up with the process of producing uh, engaging articles and please get in touch. Um, so get in touch to work with us in the magazine but also we have a new section on the website. Uh, these are much shorter uh, uh, bursts of scientific and technological news that we do. Uh, this is anybody can do that on the website. Any member can can post news comments. So if you want to be part of this please get in touch. <coughs> now the experience today of doing this live broadcast uh, which hopefully went well, uh, we're going to find out, it's looking all good at the moment, gave us the idea that actually we can do uh, a webinars, open webinars uh, of Algerian experts, both inside and outside of Algeria, 
doing live lectures to, uh, to um, a large audience. So this is something that we're going to be trying to implement. What we need is uh, volunteers to help us think through how we can implement this project, uh, volunteers to help uh, structure this, this, uh, this initiative and, and, uh, and lead it uh, if, if they wish. Um, and finally, we also want to do more of these kind of face-to-face uh, -face events like today. So we want to organize more talks uh, and uh, networking events and so on, what we call unnustled org sessions. If you're interested to get involved, to give a talk, or you know someone who's um, you know uh, interesting to uh, listen to, then please um, get in touch and uh, give us your suggestions. So that's that's kind of what's going to be happening with us for the next uh, six months, or even a little bit more than that. Um, so I thank you again for coming, uh, and I thank everybody who's been watching us uh, online. I think it, for me it's been a really exciting day. Uh, and a fantastic concretization of what we're trying to do with NUSP. Hopefully, with your support, we can uh, keep going. So thank you again. Thank you.